Now we want to begin um, our uh, new topic, our new series on quantum mechanics um, by discussing why it might be important for us to study quantum mechanics. Why is that an important thing uh, for a chemist? What is it we can learn about the universe and about the parts of the universe that we're interested in from quantum mechanics? Uh, classical physics by the turn of the 20th century, uh, beginning of the 20th century, um, was beginning to be unable to explain many observed phenomena. Um, for example, graphite conducts electricity while diamond does not. Um, we're looking at uh, covalently bonded carbon in both cases. Uh, light from a hydrogen discharge lamp only has certain wavelengths, a very small number of wavelengths, uh, and not a full uh, electromagnetic spectrum. And these things can't be explained just using classical mechanics. Um, NMR, infrared spectroscopy, ultraviolet spectroscopy, um, cannot be explained, um, uh, couldn't be developed uh, with uh, using just classical mechanics without quantum mechanics. Uh, and use of quantum mechanics will allow many areas of science to progress much, much faster, uh, including physics, chemistry, biology, um, and uh, uh, even certain other fields. Um, two key properties that distinguish quantum mechanics from classical mechanics. First one is quantization, uh, the idea that energy at the atomic level is not a continuous variable, but beco becomes in discrete sized packets called quanta. Uh, and the other one is this idea of wave particle duality. Um, all particles are waves when we consider um, energy and matter. All waves are particles. Um, this only becomes um, an issue at certain size. So at the at atomic or the subatomic level, um, atoms behave like waves and, and subatomic particles behave like waves um, and like particles at the same time and also light itself behaves as waves uh, for classically and as photons as individual discrete particles of energy um, and so we need to use both wave and particle ideas to describe the behavior of these certain size and speed um, particles. All right, so the, one of the big issues that came about, again, uh, shortly before the turn of the 20th century, um, uh, that uh, was a big failure of classical mechanics, where uh, classical mechanics ideas had to start being replaced with ideas of wave-particle duality and of quantization, it was uh, explaining black body radiation. Black body radiation is this idea of a cubicle solid with a spherical cavity inside and a small narrow uh, aperture through which uh, radiation can escape. Uh, and when that cubicle solid gets to a high temperature, it will emit photon photons from that interior spherical cavity. The photons will reflect several times inside uh, before they come out uh, the small channel. And those reflections will ensure that the radiation itself is in thermal equilibrium with the solid. Classical electromagnetic theory predicts uh, which frequencies of light will be emitted by a certain back black body um, uh, and their relative magnitudes um, using the spectral density equation. So what we have right here is the classic uh, spectral density equation where rho in that equation represents the spectral density. Nu is the frequency of the light that we're seeing. Um, e is the energy of oscillation, um, uh, energy that's generated by an oscillating dipole in the solid. D nu is on both sides of the equation because what we're really looking at is the energy density within a certain um, D nu, a certain variation of frequency around a particular frequency that we're interested in looking at. And like I said, the basis of this model is that oscillating dipoles, uh, like for example, a nucleus oscillating within its field of electrons would generate a dipole, and that those dipoles that are uh, oscillating dipoles radiate energy.
classical mechanics further predicts that the energy of oscillation is going to be directly related to the uh, temperature of the black body um, by Boltzmann's constant. And so we can substitute that back into the spectral density equation, uh, replace the energy of oscillation with kT, and we can go ahead and plot spectral density versus frequency. And what we will find is what we call the ultraviolet catastrophe. At high frequencies, um, we reach a, a infinite spectral density, um, infinite intensity by uh, what's predicted here. At low frequencies, uh, we have a pretty good um, agreement, but the high frequency uh, uh, should be um, uh, of infinite uh, intensity. Um, and then what we have is uh, experimental data points. Uh, around a certain temperature, we see a fair amount of low frequency light following along this particular spectral density equation theory. And then at a, a certain uh, frequency, we start to see the intensity trail off. So at high frequency, at ultraviolet or beyond, we see very low uh, intensity. And that data matches almost exactly um, the equation that Planck would derive thinking about light in a slightly different, really a significantly different manner. Uh, Max Planck proposed that the problem with classical theory was in the assumption that the energy of oscillation is directly related to temperature. The discrepancy occurs at high frequencies, not at low frequencies. So he uh, proposed that the energy of the light radiated by the dipoles is related to the frequency rather than to the amplitude, rather than to um, what we would call uh, spectral density or, uh, or intensity. Um, so if the energy um, is some number n, a positive integer, times a proportionality constant um, that we'll call h, we call it Planck's constant, um, times the frequency. So this allowed, Frank to, uh, it allowed Planck to derive a new expression for the oscillation energy um, that looked like this. Um, h nu over e to the h nu over kt, so kt is still a factor, uh, minus 1. Now the key thing in any new theory is that it has to agree with the old theory in places where the old theory was correct, and then it has to be better than the old theory in places where the old theory broke down. And so um, at high temperature, uh, if we expand the previous uh, equation, expand Planck's equation that he just derived in a taylor maclaurin series, uh, what we see is that at very high temperature, uh, we reach a point where the energy of oscillation will become kT, but at low temperatures, the denominator becomes large for all except for the very lowest frequencies, and the energy of oscillation drops to zero. So the high frequency terms don't contribute to the spectral density, uh, and we have a new spectral density equation that looks this way. Um, and matches experiment perfectly. So Planck was able to derive a new spectral density equation that he matched experiment perfectly by assuming that light's energy was related to its frequency rather than its intensity, and he was the first one uh, to do that. Uh, another um, experimental problem that couldn't be explained by classical mechanics, this is what uh, Albert Einstein won his Nobel Prize for. Um, classical theory predicts that for the photoelectric effect, the number of electrons ejected and the ejection velocity will both depend only on the intensity of the light beam. For example, if a uh, non-intense infrared beam ejects no electrons, then the idea is that a very intense infrared beam would e eject more, or at least some electrons from a surface. So we set up a situation like this where we're shining light onto uh, this particular surface that is hooked to the negative terminal of a battery. So um, there's some voltage here. We can eject electrons from this surface by hitting them with a beam of light. They come loose, they get attracted to the positive terminal, and we get current 
when light is shining here and no current when light isn't shining. The problem is that the experiment shows that the number of electrons uh, ejected depend on the intensity but that the velocity and the ability to eject them at all depends on frequency. So this agrees with Max Planck's theory that energy is related to frequency and if the energy isn't large enough, if the frequency isn't large enough, it doesn't matter how many beams of light we bomb onto a surface of a metal, it's not going to eject an electron. So what Albert Einstein did was proposed that um, the energy of light is proportional to its frequency and that the kinetic energy of an electri ejected electron must be that energy minus whatever work is required to remove it from the solid. So he set up this idea. The energy, uh, kinetic energy of an uh, ejected electron is equal to some constant times nu minus uh, the ionization energy of the metal basically. What we call the work function. And so that term is going to depend on the metal itself um, and then um, what we have here is a great equation for chemists even though Einstein was a physicist y equals mx plus b so if we plot for a particular metal the uh, ejection energy of an electron um, based on the velocity I'm sorry the um, frequency of the light um, shined on there we get a graph that looks like this and the slope is what Einstein would have called beta in that previous equation but as it turns out it's exactly h it's exactly the constant that Planck came up with so this was another um, experiment that confirmed Planck's ideas and Einstein's ability to explain it uh, in this uh, in this way got him the Nobel Prize all right, so here's an example that we will work in class. Um, go ahead and, and pause the video and, and you can write this question down. Try it out on your own. Um, and the key is going to be units, uh, making sure that you're converting between SI units and electron volts um, to get the right answer. And we'll work this one together in class next time we meet. Uh, now, electrons are emitted by the surface even when the intensity of the light is barely enough that the sum of all the energy on the whole surface um, is barely enough to eject one electron. Um, so that means that uh, all of that light can be focused onto one electron rather than spread across the whole surface. Um, Einstein, uh, to paraphrase his thoughts, um, we treat the light like a particle um, and uh, think of it that way so that if you think of it this way if we're trying to bang a hole into our uh, plaster wall or our drywall wall um, it doesn't matter how many ping pong balls we throw against it the ping pong balls aren't big enough to hurt the wall the, um, but a bowling ball it'll only take one uh, so in that sense light is behaving like a particle not like a group of waves very very non-intense but high enough frequency light will eject some electrons whereas very very intense but not high enough in frequency light will not eject electrons.